the rash initially, Tom? Well, well, that's debatable, too. We have a Lyme expert here in Duluth who goes on the radio and says it has to be the size of a basketball, and that's just ridiculous. Yeah, that's too big. That's yeah. ridiculous. I mean, in the literature, throughout the literature, it says two and a half centimeters, but the truth is about half the people never get a rash, and that could be they've been previously exposed to Lyme disease and they're not getting a rash the second time around. It could be that they just uh, haven't mounted the immune response that they need to create inflammation that creates the red rash. Uh, There's reasons why people don't get the rash. Some uh, kids, they roll around in the weeds and the bushes and their rash might be under their their hair, on their scalp. So Mm -hmm. And also, you know, people who live alone, if they get a rash on their back, uh, who's going to see it? What percent of the ticks have Lyme disease? Uh, well, this is, this is what got me in trouble. Not that uh, you go out and count every tick, but I'd like to know. In, in 1985, I, I took a attached tick to my doctor, and she told me only 3% of the ticks are infected, and um, they rarely transmit the disease, and if you get it, it's usually self-limiting, and uh, we just treat it for two weeks and you're cured. And she said this so matter-of-factly that I just assumed that this was all true. And, of course, now we know that none of that is true. Um, in Pine County here, I actually did a study. We went back and we looked at ticks that were uh, infected, and they started keeping records in 1988, and by 2002, uh, from 1988 to 2002, the ticks went from 6% infected to 60% infected in Pine County. And during that time, I also tracked the reported cases of multiple sclerosis at the local MS center here, and it went from 120 cases to 330 cases. And I'm very interested in that topic because that's what they told me I had for two years was multiple sclerosis. And how do they treat you? What do they give you? For Lyme disease? For, for, for thinking you had MS. For oh, example. well, basically nothing. Uh, they, put, uh, they put me on a waiting list for a bed at an assisted living. And uh, I was going to be transferred out until this doctor had uh, come in on Monday and realized that I had a chance of recovery. I mean, that's how far gone I was. My vision was the size of a basketball in front of my my face. I was basically going blind. Um, I couldn't function. I couldn't put two words together. Uh, My head had so much pressure in it that I, I couldn't concentrate or think. Every day it got worse and worse, and it did this for over a year. And uh, there's a point where you just say, well, I'm done with this. I I can't beat this. Um, But that gave me a ray of hope. And when they started antibiotics on me, every muscle in my body started to twitch. And I, I just started pouring out sweat, and I had heart palpitations, and I had visual and auditory hallucinations. This thing had really gotten into my brain, and it affected me uh, in so many ways. Um, for instance, for five years after treatment, I had no sensation of thirst. I would go huh. for days without drinking until I was so dehydrated and never had uh, you know, the desire to drink water. Jeez, that's so a good had, way to die, Tom. Well, right. Uh, but you, you start to learn these things, and then, then you say, well, I, I've just got to carry water with me all the time and drink all the time, even if I'm not thirsty. Uh, temporal distortion. Um, I had no concept of time. If somebody told me that something was going to happen uh, tomorrow, it would seem like a week away. You were that out of it? Oh, yes. Absolutely. And it affected your career, no doubt. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't drive. I I voluntarily didn't drive a car for about five years other than back and forth to the doctor Um, and just functioning day-to-day life for uh, family and friends. uh, It just changed dramatically. On a 1 to 10, Tom, with uh, 10 being the highest, uh, how would you rate the severity of Lyme disease and the need to get the word out about it? Well, Let's put it this way. Every patient that I have ever talked to that was as far gone as I was has died. And what? 
Absolutely, and people don't realize this, that people are dying of this disease. They All right, let's, let's talk more about this. Uh, we're, we're devoting this night to talk about Lyme disease, and you're beginning to find... And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Uh, Tom, we were talking about uh, some kind of uh, cl- criteria here, and I'd like you to uh, I- explain what that is. <clears throat> well, diagnosis of Lyme disease has been controversial for almost since the, the beginning. But when Yale really promoted this idea of what's called two-tiered testing, uh, I think it created really the belief that testing is acceptable for making the diagnosis of Lyme disease. And the trouble with this is the tests are so poor, and they're actually designed that way. Now, if the first test is 50% inaccurate, and then the second test after they change the reporting criteria is about only 50% accurate, well, what are the chances of you getting a positive Lyme test? Well, if you multiply 50% times 50%, it's about a 25% chance. That's statistics. Uh, but the um, another problem with these tests is they're antibody-based tests. Not every Lyme patient makes adequate antibodies, and you have to give the test at the right time. If you're bitten by a tick today, Mm-hmm. Your Lyme test probably won't be positive for uh, 30 days. Jeez. So are you going to wait 30 days before you seek treatment, if, even if you have symptoms? And that's one of the problems. From the time this bacteria enters your body, it's penetrating blood vessels and it's circulating. Now, I would tell your readers, if you want to actually see this in a video, just go to uh, Google and look at spirochetes unwound, and a Canadian researcher, and this is in real time, and this is what's amazing, he took living mice, and he dyed their blood vessels red in their ear. Then he took immune fluorescent antibody and dyed the bacteria bright green, so you can see it, and then he injected the the mice. The bacteria attaches to a blood vessel creates a hole and penetrates into the tissue in one and a half minutes, 90 seconds. That's all it takes. That's fast. Well, but now imagine that you're going to wait 30 days before you get the results of your test back, before you get treated or even diagnosed. And then this this infection then could run rampant through your body. Yeah, it can get everywhere. And once it gets into places like what we call sequestered sites, into the joints, the connective tissue, the heart, the brain, especially the brain, it is almost impossible to detect with serology tests. And that's why we're asking for better pathology studies. We've been advocating for this for over 10 years, and we just can't get them to budge on this. We want a multi-center study looking at brain autopsies in dementia patients, Alzheimer's patients, MS patients, and people with a history of chronic Lyme. And um, I think once we look at those results, we can draw some accurate conclusions. But right now, we're just operating on hypotheses and theories that are saying Lyme disease is a self-limiting disease. Is there a seasonality to Lyme disease, Tom? Well, certainly, we we see that in the spring when the uh, nymphs are first uh, hatching, if you're bit in April or May, you're most likely to develop symptoms in July. So now that bacteria has been circulating in your body since May, and you're getting diagnosed in July, that's a long time to go. Um, So a lot of these patients, when they are treated with two weeks of antibiotics, we see that a month or so later, they relapse. And this creates another problem because the Infectious Disease Society of America, which really tells physicians how to diagnose and treat this illness, has pretty much put um, absolute terms out there saying that you have to treat with doxycycline and you have to treat for two weeks. And after that, you'd have no need to treat any longer. Now, insurance companies love that, 
but it's not really good science, and it's certainly not good medicine, and it's not good for any Lyme patient with late-stage Lyme disease. All right, let's go to some of the calls we've got here. Uh, Alex in Hollywood, California. Hi there. Hi, how are you? We're doing great, thanks. Um, I have Lyme disease, and I can't, I'm sure you've heard my story a million times, and I can't get anyone to treat me or test me for it. Um, so I've been treating it naturally, and um, and I just, I don't know, I really kind of want to, I would love for you to check out my blog, but I would like to know, how do I go about getting tested to see what's going on? Because I also, when I was 18, I had syphilis, so it's interesting. They gave me like three shots in the bum with uh, penicillin, and I'm, after fighting this Lyme disease, I have more gallons as well. After fighting this the last 16, 17 months, I'm thinking the penicillin wasn't enough. All right. Uh, um, you know, what, what, so. what do you recommend here, Tom? Well, <clears throat> there's some thought that um, bactericidal antibiotics like penicillin and the cephalosporins, that they actually kill the bacteria when they divide, but they don't get inside cells very well, and we think some of this bacteria goes intracellular in human cells, and it also pushes the bacteria into an alternative form called the cyst form. And the cyst form is especially prevalent in the brain, and it's very hard to detect and to test for. But regular antibiotics like penicillin and amoxicillin and so on don't really affect the cyst form. And there's been two or three very good papers just recently that have outlined this, one by uh, Dr. Ava Sappi from New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, and she has tested some of the natural things that might not only attack the cyst form, but also what we call biofilms. Now, the antibiotics, doxycycline and the macrolides, they don't promote the cyst form, but also they don't seem to kill the cyst form. So what we're thinking is now that you've already had um, antibiotic therapy with uh, I, uh, intramuscular penicillin, that it might be time to look at something like metronidazole, which is known to uh, kill the cyst form, uh, maybe uh, adding what they do in Europe, grapefruit seed extract, which also helps uh, promote this uh, breakdown of this form. But you have to discuss this with a doctor and have a doctor who's willing to try these things. Now, one thing that you can do on your own, and I have a really great story about uh, penicillin and syphilis in uh, 1945 during the war. All right. But here's the thing. Heat is an enemy of this bacteria. Heat. And Yes, heat, uh, hyperthermia treatments, and you have to be careful. I mean, I'm, I'm not advocating that you, you know, cook yourself alive here. Yeah, don't, don't microsol- <laughs> microwave yourself. But um, I, I really think a big key to my success in treatment was I combined it with hot tubbing, at, and I kept the water at 108 degrees, and this is above the normal temperature that we would consider uh, sure. tolerable. Which is, yeah, which is as hot as you want to get it. Yeah, 105 is what most people can tolerate. But this bacteria really doesn't start to die until you get it to 108 degrees Fahrenheit. And even then, we can't get the core temperature up to that. We can only get uh, the skin temperature up. But it turns out the skin is a place where a lot of the bacteria goes dormant and can survive. Uh, we have instances where people have had uh, a, a rash, a Lyme rash, and 10 years later, we've been able to culture the bacteria out of that rash. 